Hello and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual programming series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. And through these spirited conversations, we're pleased to kick open the doors to the National Archives and it's more than 15 billion records that are held in trust for the American public. Thank you for joining us today at home. We're delighted to host our next edition of the Presidential Library Series with the Truman Library. Our guest speaker today will be taking your questions. So uh, we wanna make sure you know how to ask those questions. We'll be using the chat function in YouTube. So uh, just to get a little practice now, go ahead and put your hometown and state. I see some of our friends, our regulars are already in there doing that. And later on in the program, I will give you a shout out. Now I'm pleased to introduce our featured speaker today, Kurt Graham became the director of the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum in 2015. Dr. Graham has an extensive experience in the library and museum world. He directed the McCracken Research Library at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming, the leadership position of the Church History Museum in Salt Lake. And prior to that, he was a member of the history factor, faculty at Cal State University, San Bernardino. Kurt, are you with us? I'm here. Hey, Patrick. Terrific, how are you doing today? Great, how are you doing? All right, all right. And how's everyone there doing uh, with everything we're dealing with, the staff of the museum and the, and the yeah. library? We've been, we've been teleworking primarily since, you know, the, since the pandemic uh, started. We've been undergoing a major renovation, of course, that we're gonna talk about tonight. And, and fortunately, a lot of that has been able to continue as kind of essential work with construction. But in terms of our federal staff, we've been uh, you know, doing a lot of work remotely and, and very efficiently. I mean, it's, it's been a good, uh, a good thing in some ways. We've done a lot of these virtual programs as well and continue to reach our audiences. And I think these are very important moments, but uh, you know, we all miss the live human interaction as well. And uh, I, think, uh, I think this has been a tough time for everybody, but I think on the whole, uh, most, of, most of our staff has responded very well to it. Well, that's great. Yeah, I think we were all trying to do it adapt as well as possible and make, yeah. make the most of it. So uh, fortunately, I think all the vaccine news will be hopefully seeing more real people and not virtual people uh, in yeah. our own places here in our museums. Well, I know you've got a great presentation set up. You're going to tell us all about this, this new museum and uh, the opportunities when allowed to come see you in person, what all the new fancy things that you've got to show everybody. So I'm going to pass the screen off to you and let you have at it. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that, Patrick. And thank you for all the work that you and the National Archives Foundation does. You know, each one of the presidential libraries has a, a private uh, foundation as well. In our case, the Truman Library Institute. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful relationship that uh, nonprofit 501c3 status is so important and that private public partnership uh, can be so effective and so efficient. And I'm very grateful for the Truman Library Institute and certainly likewise the National Archives Foundation and all that, that you all do for all of us. Um, we got some slides here and you'll see the first one coming up is a slide of our new entrance. I'm going to walk you through uh, the renovation that we've done. We were just completing a $26 million capital renovation of the Truman Library. All new exhibits, a modest expansion of the building. This is a new entrance on what used to be the backside of the museum. It is now where the parking lot is. It's now the main entrance. And we're very, very pleased and, and proud of all this and excited to get to share it with this audience. Um, uh, you know, I've seen this on drawings and renderings and architects, you know, photos and whatnot for the last uh, five years. And it is so gratifying to get to see this in real life and to realize that this dream is actually coming to fruition. And I think that uh, when our guests can finally come through these doors, and experience the Truman Library. They're gonna have a wonderful experience. I just maybe would give a shout out as we get going. I mentioned the Truman Library Institute, and of course we have a wonderful federal staff, but the project that you're going to see is, uh, uh, we've had several people working on this. The architect, this, this first facade that you see was designed by Clark Anderson Architects. Uh, the general construction, general contractor was J.E. Dunn. And our exhibit design, when you get inside the exhibits, uh, those were done by Gallagher and Associates. And the media pieces that, um, that really highlight some of the great areas in those galleries were done by Manadnock Media, a media development firm. So all of those and many other subcontractors, we've had a great run and excited to, uh, 
to kind of give a shout out to that team because this this is not your grandma's Truman Library. Uh, this is a very different kind of organization. It's not just a refresh of our exhibits. It is a complete reimagining of Harry Truman's legacy and how to convey that and how to, to deliver the impact of this important, critically important, I think, legacy to a 21st century audience. And that's what this was all about. So as you walk through these doors, it, there's you, you see the light overhead there <clears throat> coming in. Those are south facing windows on the on the left that up, up high. And it gives you a sense almost cathedral like as you enter. And I think what I'm most pleased about that is it is a tribute of becoming the 33rd president. It is something that is worthy of Truman's legacy. And I think that as you walk in those doors, you get a sense that something important is about to happen and something is. Um, so as we go to the next slide, you'll see the opening of the uh, of the new exhibits. Everything in this building is, uh, in terms of exhibitry, is new. We went down to bare walls uh, on both levels, and everything is uh, completely, completely brand new. So on the left, you would enter the exhibit, and on the right is where you would come out of the exhibit. So it begins in a theater that is set uh, in uh, 1945, and as we move into that room, into the next slide, you'll see that this is a standing theater where you walk in and the world is set in 1945. And you enter the chaos of the war coming to an end. Uh, starts with the 44 Democratic Convention. Franklin Roosevelt is renominated. Truman, somewhat reluctantly, uh, wasn't really happy about it, but becomes the Democratic nominee for vice president. And, and this program is playing, the war is progressing. You see the turmoil and the tension that is involved in the society and the country at that time. And the program is suddenly interrupted with a news bulletin in, in, in uh, authentic uh, newsreel footage uh, by a narrator from 1945 saying that Franklin Roosevelt has died. And the question that this theater poses is who is this farmer from Missouri who is about to take over the reins of the, of the free world? And the question that everyone had in those days as the journalists and others that were writing about this put it of Harry Truman they said, can he swing the job? That was how they, how they said that, you know, is he up to the task? He was a little known farmer from Missouri, hadn't gone to college, you know, wasn't a, a blue blood, well-bred uh, Harvard grad like FDR. How, how would he be able to handle this was the question. And so that sets up for us an opportunity as we move into the next gallery to begin to answer those questions. Where does Harry Truman come from? And what is it that gave him the kind of grit and the kind of capacity, the kind of ability to lead the world as he did. So you see, for example, now you can see we're still in construction, we're finishing up uh, the construction phase. So this is a definitely a behind the scenes tour. But that piano in that case, for example, Truman was very nearsighted as a boy. So he couldn't go out and play sports and rough and tumble with everybody else because he couldn't see very well. So he'd put on his spectacles and played the piano. And by the way, he read every book in the library. And so as a result of that, he gets a certain kind of training as a certain kind of, of, of youth. And those letters, that tower of letters that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, those are letters uh, during their courtship that he wrote to Bess. They met when they were just little kids, six years old in Sunday school. And he claims he never forgot those little blonde curls. And he uh, went on to, uh, you know, knew her through high school and, and, and later eventually, of course, uh, began to, to court her. And his, his younger life, um, his, the Grandview Farm experience, all of the early years of Harry Truman kind of culminates in a big decision that he made to go be a part of World War I. And so you'll see we have a special theater that's, uh, that's dedicated to World War I. You see a French 75 in the case on there. Truman is in France. He learns how to command this group, Battery D, and, and uh, that white screen you see behind behind all of that is a almost it's not a surround but it takes up one whole wall of that theater and and tells the story of harry truman of world war one it's an incredibly important story not so much because truman played such an important role uh for the united states but um it's important to harry truman because he comes home from the war knowing that he can lead he had this battery d i mentioned it's a bunch of uh by their own count later, a bunch of uh, rowdy uh, Irish Catholics who were fond of drink and not very fond of their new uh, bespeckled Southern Baptist leader. And they took bets on how long he would last. And he won them over. 
And it was because of that, when Truman came back from the war, that he realized, though he lacked charisma, he lacked stature, he lacked a commanding voice and a commanding presence, there were things about him that definitely were not the kinds of things that we often associate with leadership, but he knew he could lead. And he knew that men would follow him. He knew that he could inspire uh, leadership. And uh, so anyway, he comes home from the war and then he starts his life um, in Jackson County. He marries Bass after the war and he gets involved in, uh, in politics because of a connection he made during the war. And so in the next slide, you'll see um, a reference to what was called the Pendergast machine. Now machine politics were pretty prominent in those days. Uh, Truman was, uh, uh, was, was brought up through that system. Now, today we just call it party politics. It's not that different, frankly, but uh, there, are, there were people behind the scenes, namely Tom Pendergast. His nephew had served with Truman in World War I, and they were looking for someone from Eastern Jackson County to be what in those days they called a judge. It's basically a county commissioner, a county executive. And uh, they, he said, no, it's this guy Truman. You ought to reach out to him. And so they did. And Truman became a county judge and, and really took it seriously and really became a very dedicated public servant right from the beginning. Truman's goal was to be governor of Missouri. And they overlooked him for that. They passed him over. And he was quite disappointed about that. And then suddenly, uh, quite surprisingly, in 1934, they tapped him on the shoulder and said, we want to put you up for Senate. And so he ran and won a seat in the Senate. And he spent 10 years in the Senate and he loved the Senate and he did not want to leave the Senate, but he agreed to be a vice president when, when uh, he was sort of, uh, his arm was twisted, I guess we could say. He didn't want to become vice president because he said that vice presidents, history is not kind to those who come in through the back door. And so uh, that was uh, something he knew, everybody knew that Roosevelt was, uh, somewhat ill and not going to necessarily be um, around for forever. They didn't think he would last the full term. Now, no one knew that he was only going to last 82 days. So 82 days into his vice presidency, Harry Truman becomes the president. And in the next slide, you'll see a gallery that talks about Truman's first four months on the job. And this gallery sort of looks like a timeline, but it all it looks kind of funnels as you see it narrows as you go through it. And you can see down there at the end in that construction, there's a, a cylinder, a clear cylinder case. And that cylinder is going to house the safety plug that was in the atomic bomb that went off over Nagasaki. And behind that, you can't see it in this frame, but behind that is a paper crane that was folded by the little girl Sadaku who uh, was two years old when the bomb went off. And she died 10 years later at the age of 12 from radiation induced leukemia. So she died not in the blast, but as a result of the blast. And because of that, she, um, uh, she folded all these little paper cranes and we were, we, are, we were able to get one of those from her brother uh, several years ago um, as one of the last ones that she folded. So our way of handling the bomb is looking at the plug, which is uh, a safety plug that uh, literally has the fingerprints of a US airman on it, the trigger of the atomic age, juxtaposed with that um, paper crane, which is a symbol of peace that comes out of that era. Now, uh, a well-known historian recently wrote a book about Truman's first four months. It's called The Accidental President, A.J. Bain, great book if you're interested in that particular period. And he said, never has so much history been shoehorned into so little time. I'd like you to think about the last time you started a job or you know, you think about on the job training and kind of how we all have the little jitters or whatever when we start a new position and we wonder if we're up to the task. Truman became president on April 12th of 1945. By August, the bombs had been dropped and the war was over. Um, that's what you call on the job training. In four months, he had brought the, Germany surrendered on his birthday, which is May 8th. He turned 61 years old and said it was the best birthday present he'd ever had. He then went to Potsdam, met with Stalin and Churchill and others, and uh, uh, got word there that the test in New Mexico had been successful. And, and there's a lot going on for Truman in those first four months. And he drops those bombs, makes that decision, the war is over. Now, what's interesting about Harry Truman is that's the one thing that people know about Truman, that he dropped the bombs. Well, and they know that he had a buck stops here sign on his desk. 
Those are the two things that we assume that people know. We don't assume anything else when people come through the doors. But what's really interesting is when those bombs are dropped, Harry Truman still has seven and a half years to go of being president. So the real heart of his legacy is not, in my mind, ending the war. It's, um, it's winning the peace. It's, it's how do you put the world back together? And as you turn into the next gallery, what you see is a globe that, that will cast projections of all of the problems that are going on around the world, both domestically and abroad. And, you know, hunger, I mean, just the, the kinds of, all the infrastructure in Europe that's just been completely uh, destroyed, the way food is delivered, the way, the way sewer and garbage is taken away, the way utilities and, you know, power and, and, and water and, and, and fuel and things are brought to homes, all of that is disrupted. And so you have a world that is literally fractured, literally coming apart. So those problems will be highlighted on that globe. Around the perimeter of that room, are Truman's responses to those problems. So you'll, you'll see something about the Nuremberg trials, you know, the, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, uh, ultimately the founding of NATO. The way that Truman put in place, what I would argue is the architecture, the structure, along with Winston Churchill and others, that has brought more peace and more prosperity to more people than at any other comparable time in human history. Um, I'm not saying we haven't had wars and problems in the last 75 years, but the fact is um, he ushered in a period that is um, unlike any other comparable period, I think, in human history. And off to the side of this, we have an interesting um, theater that you'll see in the next slide that is, we call it, we call it the rubble theater. And what it is, is it looks like a bombed out city. That's not uh, construction debris that you see in the, in the foreground there. That's actually the theater. That's what it looks like. And, and when you walk into the theater, that's all it looks like. And then when you sit down and the show begins, it projects, it's called projection mapping onto these different surfaces. And, these, and the story, uh, basically the advent of the Cold War, how we go from you know, a Soviet ally to, a, to, to being on the other side of that with the Soviets. And so you see the map of Europe there. It, it looks uh, just like part of the garbage as you walk in there, part of the rubble until it begins to until the show begins and it, and it gives you a sense of how that, how that happens. So we want visitors to go away with a sense of how important uh, this period is and, and the advent of this, of this new kind of, of warfare, really, this new kind of tension around the globe that lasts, you know, the Cold War goes, uh, you know, up until, you know, well into Reagan. And I mean, I guess you could argue with the, with the Berlin Wall coming down under Bush, that's uh, maybe when you'd put an end to it, but it's, it's very, uh, it, it, it's defi it definitely sets the stage for foreign policy for the next uh, several presidents. And so that, that becomes an important piece. As we move on from there, uh, as Truman ends, uh, nears the end of that first term, and uh, in the course of rebuilding the world, one of the big decisions he faces in 1948, this is in May, is to recognize the newly declared state of Israel. And it's a very interesting decision for Truman because he has people in his own uh, administration, uh, his own State Department is opposed to this uh, very vehemently. And so Truman is facing this decision, like what do I do with you know, half, the people, <laughs> half the people around me say to do it, half the people say don't, to do, it, don't, don't do it. And he, is, uh, he struggles with that. And, and, but in the end, within minutes of the state being declared, uh, Harry Truman extends recognition to this new founded state. And, uh, and then as you follow that up, this is May of 48. Uh, in the next gallery, we have Truman's civil rights legacy, which uh, there are many things that Truman did in terms of civil rights, and we can get into some of that maybe in the, in the Q&A if, if you're interested. But, but the main thing I want to point out here is that Truman desegregated the armed forces and the federal workforce in July of 1948. So he recognizes Israel in May. He desegregates the government and the, and the armed forces in July. Now remember, he has to run for office that fall. Now this was when elections lasted two and a half months and not two and a half years like they do now. But nevertheless, it was a risk. Some people have argued even to this day, and I'll just sort of give you both sides of this. And um, some people will say, well, you know, Truman, he. The Jewish bloc and the African-American bloc of voters were very important to him. So in doing this, you know, he won some voters over. 
And I have no doubt that those voters uh, were for Truman and that they did, and, and he did care about them as voters. But I think he cared about them as people more because it was a risk. Um, remember, this is 1948. Uh, I think Truman alienated as many people with those decisions, particularly the segregation, uh, desegregation decisions in 1948 as he, as he brought voters to him. So it, he may have, have won some support among the, 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 the uh, Jewish voters and African-American voters, but uh, he divided his own party and risked losing the election uh, as the Southern Democrats turned on him, the Dixiecrats under the leadership of Strom Thurmond. And Truman's uh, decision or statement there was, I'd rather be right than be president. And uh, I, I don't know that a lot of people in our history have taken that approach. And I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, that Truman's legacy is so important to us today. But I mentioned that he has to run for office in 1948. So in the next uh, gallery, what you see is the back end of a train there where Truman would come off of the, um, uh, about, uh, the, the end of the, the train there, come out of the, uh, in a, at a whistle stop somewhere and people would gather around and they came by the thousands and he would stand there and deliver a stump speech. And uh, that's where the phrase, give him hell Harry comes from. Uh, somebody in the back would yell, invariably they'd say, give him hell Harry. And he'd say, I'm gonna do just that. Um, he later said, he said, I never gave anybody hell. I just told them the truth and they thought it was hell. But uh, in any event, uh, that whistle stop campaign was a watershed moment in American electoral politics. Before that, you didn't run for election, you stood for election. And to get out and kind of grovel for votes and go right directly to the people in that way was not necessarily um, you know, becoming. It, it, it seemed a little ambitious. It seemed maybe even a little bit desperate. So it was a new way of politicking. And Truman went and he predicted he looked at the electoral map and the electoral college and he said, here's how I think the states are going to go. And he didn't miss it by far. And he won pretty handily if, when you look at the numbers. But of course the press, everybody thought, no, no, he's, there's not a chance for poor old Harry, nice guy, but not gonna happen. So you see up in the left-hand side there, the graphic that, that famous photo of him with the newspaper, Dewey defeats Truman. The newspaper reporters didn't even, were so confident they didn't even stay up to watch the returns. They just printed their story and went to bed. And uh, Truman was, uh, was uh, very pleased, very proud of that headline uh, after the fact that he you know, was able to, to win that election and win it so, so handily. So as he wins that election, he's now president in his own right. And he begins his second term with the fair deal, which is very interesting because you know, things that Truman dealt with were front and center in the fair deal, like the minimum wage or housing or you know, aid to farmers. I mean, just about anything you can imagine that we're dealing with today, Truman tried to incorporate into the fair deal, didn't have as much legislative success as he had hoped. He had his own legislative agenda, every reason to think that he was on the up uh, tick after this stunning election. But um, he runs into a problem, and we see this at the beginning of the second term as we advance to the next slide, in um, the, the, the red scare and the whole notion that there are a bunch of communists in the State Department and elsewhere. And so we begin the second term by talking about the loyalty oath program that Truman had to put in place. And this is a very interesting moment. You see a, an interactive there in this, in this shot that it's a game basically that uh, six players sit around this table. And the way it worked is if you were accused of, as a government employee, if you were suspected of having communist sympathies or whatever, uh, you could be brought before a group that would basically decide your fate, whether you would stay in government service or not. And that decision was based on a questionnaire, on a series of questions. Now we, we have taken all of the questions in this game, and I think it'll be quite interesting, especially for younger people to experience these questions because the questions that were on this uh, loyalty oath uh, a survey were things like, you know, have you ever read the Communist Manifesto? What do you think of it? What do you think about interracial marriage? What do you think about homosexuality? Uh, what church do you go to and how often do you attend? I mean, it's, it's mind boggling to think that those questions were designed to ferret out whether someone was loyal to the United States, but that was, that was what it was. 
And so we begin with that. And, and I think, you know, this was before um, the McCarthy hearings and things really got going in full swing. Of course, it just it went even crazier from there, as, as you know. But what really got in Truman's way was not, I think he could have probably put this to rest, but um, in 1950, he's home in Independence and he gets a call, again, as he's anticipating his legislative agenda, all the things he wants to accomplish in his second term. He's sitting at home at his home in Independence and he gets a call, Mr. President, North Korea has invaded South Korea. And he hops on a plane, flies back to Washington, it's such a secret meeting that even the wait staff that are serving them dinner, he calls his closest advisors over to the White House. They have dinner together. They don't mention a word about this until everyone is done with the meal and the wait staff are, are out and they shut the doors and they say, now what are we going to do? And this, this wonderful exhibit here is, is a much more robust treatment of the Korean War than we've ever, ever had before. Talks about MacArthur, the firing of MacArthur, the the, the, the good things that MacArthur did there that Truman was supportive of, ultimately he overreached. Um, we tell that story from a soldier's point of view. We have a couple of really marvelous collections. But Truman decides early on in, in that second term in 1950, he writes a note to himself saying, no, I'm not going to run again. He could have run again. He, he was grandfathered into the, uh, you know, the, the limitation that was passed during his term, but he had decided not to run. And it's probably just as well, he wouldn't have won anyway, most likely by the end of that term, he was pretty unpopular because of the Korean War. Um, he, um, I think my, can you, I'm sorry, I think my screen has gone a little wonky here. Can you see just the screen? Uh, we can still hear you okay. and see you. And you can still see just, the, okay, my, somehow my, my email has come into, uh, into view in a way that I, I didn't necessarily want to make that part of your experience. I apologize for that little snafu there. Um, but moving on, if um, as he goes um, through the war, you know, people are very critical of him, and and it becomes a problem in that um, you know you've got the bomb, why not use it? I mean, his his restraint is seen as weakness. The idea that he doesn't want to start a world war, he doesn't want to draw China into war. He thought we were on the cusp of World War III. He was very, very uh, concerned about that. And so um, as he does that um, uh, and, and, and exercise that restraint, his popularity goes down down. As you know, MacArthur comes back, is, is given uh, uh, kind of a hero's welcome, if you will. And so uh, to embarrass Truman, and, and Truman ends up you know, kind of leaving office with some of the lowest poll numbers in recorded history. It's only all these years later, and really when Johnson gets bogged down in the quagmire of Vietnam, that people start to realize that, you know, there's something worse than a stalemate in Asia. Uh, you can actually lose. And I think Truman's restraint in the aftermath of Vietnam came to be seen in the context of, of wisdom and, uh, and, and strength as opposed to weakness. So, um, Going on to the next then, uh, Truman, as he leaves office, he comes home to um, Independence and he's in uh, uh, Welcome Home, Mr. Citizen. He builds this library and this, as you'll see, um, that mural is painted by Thomas Hart Benton, the famous uh, Missouri artisan who, artist who he hired and commissioned to do this. But it's all about Independence and the opening of the West. Independence was a, a place that, um, uh, was the jumping off point, I guess, for Western expansion. And Truman was very proud of that history. And so he told Thomas Hart Benton to paint democracy. Now that, that, that mural does not necessarily encapsulate the definition of democracy that you and I would be comfortable with today. But nevertheless, I find it interesting that Truman opted not to celebrate himself or his accomplishments in office. He wanted the first, this big, beautiful piece of art to be about his hometown and about its role in opening the American West and being part of a large national narrative. And I find that really interesting that, that he is nowhere in, in the picture uh, in his own library in that way. He did not see this building or this institution as a shrine to himself. He saw it as a place for young people to come and learn about democracy and particularly about the presidency and how, how that worked. Um, going on to the next, then we, we have a, a gallery that talks about the Trumans in Washington. This talks about their domestic life, focuses on Bess Truman, their daughter Margaret, 
um, the rebuilding of the White House when they move over to Blair House and their second term, the White House was literally falling apart. A lot of people don't realize this. The only thing original in the White House is the facade. The interior has all been redone. Uh, two more floors dug beneath it. That big beam that you see hanging behind those columns is an original beam from the original White House. Um, Margaret's piano, a leg of her piano, had begun to fall through the second uh, story. And so that became uh, part of the story. So we have an interactive there that talks about the rebuilding of the White House. And then, of course, we just move on to the legacy of Harry Truman that we can talk about. We have, uh, uh, you'll see pictures there of President Clinton, President Bush, Vice President Cheney, uh, Secretary Powell, Secretary Albright. Uh, I always say to people, the thing I love about being in the Truman business is that you really can't offend anybody. Uh, Harry Truman is beloved on both sides of the aisle. And uh, I just find that so refreshing. I mean, I have yet to meet anyone on the right or anyone on the left who doesn't look back to Harry Truman as the kind of leader that they would like to emulate. And I think that's what gives him such staying power today. And then, you know, we'll get in a little more to his legacy um, perhaps in our discussion, but, uh, but I think it's a really uh, significant uh, point that he's one of the few leaders that everyone can agree on today. Um, and finally, there's a, a last uh, uh, view here walking out of his gallery. There's a, uh, a nice view of the gravesite. Mr. and Mrs. Truman are buried out in our inner courtyard, which is a really wonderful thing for us to have them there, it adds a, a sense of solemnity to the whole institution. And uh, there's a wonderful little video that I'll finish with that Walter Cronkite narrates as, as he um, is completing the coverage, the 1972 coverage live on CBS of the internment of, of Mr. Truman. And uh, he said, you know, Harry Truman uh, was a man uniquely of his time. He was, um, you know, ordinary man, came up through the ranks. And uh, because he was that way and uniquely of his time, we will never see his life again. Now, I do hope that history will prove Cronkite wrong, but um, I will say that I do think the legacy of Harry Truman is something that is incredibly unique. Um, uh, last president, I'm sure, will never have another president who didn't go to college. I'm sure we'll never have a president who you know, was a farmer and just came up through the ranks and local politics and, and made his way all the way to the Oval Office. I think, I think that trajectory is probably gone forever. But there was something uh, wholesome about it. There was something valuable about it. And I think in preserving that legacy in this library and in this museum in this way, and especially at this time, I think that we are doing a great service for, uh, for the nation and for the world. People come from all over, I mean, ambassadors and senators and governors and, and uh, military people, retired all over the world, come to uh, pay their tribute uh, to the man from Missouri who literally changed the map of the world, who made the world a different place than they otherwise would have, would have had. So as um, I believe that was the last slide we had. So uh, Patrick, if, if you can, uh, uh, see, now my screen seems to have gone back to normal. I apologize. I don't know exactly what happened, but I had a little little wonky moment there. But anyway, I see you clearly. You good, if you did it from memory, you did a great job. Yeah. <laughs> I um, wake up in the night narrating the Truman Library. To us. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's in there. It's pretty solid. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's fantastic. And I, I know we talked a couple of weeks ago and I was thinking about, you'd asked me if I'd been there. I said, no, I haven't. And I thought back and actually I was at the old version, I guess we will say now, of the museum about 20 years ago when I was at the Smithsonian, we brought an exhibition to, oh. to the Truman Library. So um, uh, I look forward to seeing the new one. And uh, a lot of the, as you know, a lot of the presidential libraries have over the years uh, had the opportunity to update the legacy. So it's, it's a great, the, the end there is a great segue to sort of my first question. And I want to, before I jump into my questions, because I know our audience will have questions, I want to remind folks to put your questions in the chat so we can try and get to as many as we can. And while we're doing that, I will, uh, while folks are doing that, I want to enter uh, or welcome. We've got the whole country. We've got a lot of Truman fans out here. We've got Green Bay, Atlanta, Vermont, New Jersey, lots of folks from the, the DC metro area, Connecticut, Manhattan, and Queens. Those are not the same, but I have to mention both. <laughs> Uh, Albany and Ressler, um, Rensler, New York. We got North Carolina, Broken Bow, Oklahoma, St. Louis, 
Colorado, Texas, Pennsylvania, Coachella Valley, California, Portland, Oregon. We got Alabama, Florida, uh, Boston, Lexington, and Concord. But we've got the uh, the Revolutionary Crew in Massachusetts, Chevy Chase, Marion, and of course my friends in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. So we're so excited to have got a great crowd today. Um, so let's talk. Let's talk a little bit of legacy. I'm sure the questions will start to flow in here. So I've got a few just to get us kicked off. Um, obviously, over the last a uh, year or so, we have our national conversation has talked a lot about legacy of presence, especially around the, the founding of the country and key moments. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Truman's legacy may have changed or evolved from sort of when he went out of office and over time? I mean, obviously, you have a perspective that is memorialized in the, in the museum now as we look back. But can you talk a little bit about that? No, that, that's a great question. And I think it's a question that ultimately every presidential legacy has to kind of confront at a certain level, right? Because the, and, and people are often critical of presidential libraries in this sense that when, when a president first leaves office and he goes and raises a bunch of money and builds a building and puts, puts this, uh, this exhibit in, well, it's, it's pretty positive. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. You know, I mean, it's, it's always something that is very, kind of like, oh, look at all the great things we accomplished. And, you know, I mean, there, there's a certain degree to which maybe that first iteration of a presidential exhibit is, I mean, maybe it's a victory lap or something, you know, for, for that president and that administration to say, look at what we did, look how proud we should be of what we did. And, and that's, that's fair. That's a fair criticism. And I think it's also a fair opportunity for a president to take. But um, what's interesting about Truman and the older uh, libraries, and I think, I think our friends at FDR and Eisenhower and Hoover and uh, you know, even Kennedy would, would say some of these same things is that when you get far enough away from the administration to where there are no, you know, the, the, the cabinet members who were there when the critical decisions were made are gone. The family is not, um, uh, you know, divided about, about things, or maybe, maybe you're not dealing with children, you're dealing with grandchildren, you know, which is a whole different dynamic and a whole different opportunity. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, our, our presidential family, uh, Clifton Truman Daniel is our representative of the family, honorary chairman of our institute board, lovely guy, great spokesman for his grandfather's legacy, and, and a real supporter of, of, of the truth, you know, that we, so, so now you hear me talk about Truman, and I'm, I'm a fan, so I, I, I mean, I'm pretty positive on, on why I think Truman matters, because I think he matters a lot, but I also think that he didn't get everything right, and I think it's okay to talk about the things that he maybe didn't get right or the decisions where maybe he overreached. And, um, and I think that, you know, we have the luxury in these older libraries of, of knowing that, you know, uh, the former secretary of defense or, or the former vice president or the, or the president's children aren't going to be in my office, you know, kind of with a finger in the chest saying, how dare you say, you know, talk this way about my father. The fact of the matter is we, 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 vet everything we do with historians. We, we don't want hagiography. We don't want just a celebratory narrative. We, we, we carefully vet all of our um, uh, exhibit text with, with a panel of historians from different perspectives. And, and uh, so, but, but your, your question was really about how, how do these legacies change over time? So when Truman leaves office, as you noted, he lit, left with very low poll numbers. And even by the time he died in 1972, I think he just kind of had the idea, look, I did my best. You know, I did what I could in the moment. Um, I think Harry Truman would be shocked to see the degree to which we've made this about him and the degree to which, now I would argue that it's not about him, that it's really about us. I mean, that's why we need the legacy of Harry Truman to talk about our own time. But he certainly would be shocked to see himself listed as the fifth or sixth most important president ever. He's consistently ranks behind Washington, Lincoln, and the two Roosevelts, and usually mixed in with Jefferson and Ike, you know, five, six, seven, they kind of share those, those spots. Um, he wouldn't have seen that. And, and, and I'll give you just a couple of quick reasons why I think that is. One is David McCullough's incredible biography of Truman, which no one had ever undertaken that kind of a writing about Truman, and that, that, that level and that depth, and that, of course, the, the McCullough clarity and, and the beauty of his narrative is uh, unparalleled. And so that is not only the best book on Truman, it may be the best book of presidential biography uh, anywhere. Um, that certainly helped. 
the other thing, as I mentioned, was this sort of reevaluation of Truman and his handling of Korea in the aftermath of Vietnam. I think there was a, was a rethinking of Truman's uh, approach and like, wow, maybe this guy understood more than we thought. And then I just think, as I mentioned in the legacy bit, we live in such troubled and divided and just oddly divided times that Truman, though he was a rabid partisan in some ways, and he wasn't afraid to take on the, as he called them, the do nothing 80th Republican Congress. I mean, he could, he could take it to him, but he also had friends across the aisle. He knew how to get things done because he knew that those things are always based on relationships. And Harry Truman was such a pro at developing genuine relationships. So I think that's, I think that is what we miss now in our leaders, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, I think we all pine for the kind of leadership and the kind of approach that Truman took. So I think all of that comes together to kind of reevaluate and reassess his legacy. And I hope we've captured a lot of that in this new exhibit and give people an understanding. I, my proudest moments are when people go through the library and come out and say, I had no idea that Harry Truman did all of that. That, that to me is a, is a good day. Well, I think we can agree David McCullough would make yours and my biography sound great too. So, yeah, that's right. That's uh, right. Yeah. It's hard to, hard to beat a McCullough biography, which is also one of our, you know, usually one of our questions from the audience is, uh, do you recommend, is there a biography you recommend? I assume that's on the top of the list. And yeah. so you mentioned scholarship, obviously scholarship over time influences legacy. Um, I know right now you're closed, but in a normal year, whenever we get back to those things, our, our folks are coming in and doing research and using um, the research. What, what kind of research do you do? Is, has not everything been uncovered? Well, you know, it, it, that, that's a great question. And I have to admit, I have been very surprised, very pleasantly surprised in my time uh, coming up on six years now at, at the Truman Library. We have a lot of researchers, I mean, from all over the world, you know, especially in the summertime when academics are off and they are, you know, doing their research and whatnot, but they come from, they come from Europe, they come from Asia, they come from every institution. Sometimes it's journalists writing stories or, or you know, pieces for, for magazines. Sometimes it's a, a, a student writing a thesis or a dissertation. Sometimes it's somebody writing a book or an article for a scholarly publication. I mean, but it is remarkable to me to realize how much interest there is in that era. I mean, there's so many national security things, so many foreign policy things, so many domestic policy things. And, you know, we have, just at the Truman Library alone, you mentioned the billions of documents in the possession of the National Archives. Well, our little portion of that at, at our library is 16 million pages related to the Truman. Um, I mean, even a guy like McCullough who read as much as he did, didn't read 16 million pages, you know? And so there's always you know, there's always new insights and new interpretations, but occasionally, not as much as, as a newer library would get, but occasionally we will get, um, you know, a box of letters from Aunt Sally's attic somewhere that somebody had and they corresponded with the president or their dad did or something. And all of a sudden we have this little treasure trove of letters that we didn't have before. So there, there is new material that does come to light from time to time. Right, and uh, we've got someone who's representing the Truman Scholarship Foundation watching uh, today, so they're okay. they're pleased to be be a part of this. Um, I see we've got Great a couple program. of questions. Give them a plug. Great program. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in here. And uh, does the museum? I'll start with a fun one. Does the museum make any reference of his love of poker? <laughs> uh, yeah, there. I mean, there's certainly that's certainly a big part of uh, you know Truman didn't play poker you know, for money, he wasn't a high stakes gambler. He wasn't, you know, like an addictive gambler or anything like that, but he, it was just a stress release for him. And that was kind of um, just something he enjoyed doing. And it was kind of a penny ante kind of thing that they'd play down in Florida at his, uh, 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 the little white house is called in Key West. It was a naval facility at the time where he would spend, you know, some of the colder months every once in a while. And, and he'd, he'd play on the train, you know, as the presidential train was going around, uh, famously played a game with Winston Churchill on the way out to deliver the Iron Curtain speech. So certainly uh, that's a part of Truman's uh, uh, past. We, we, you know, and, and we certainly acknowledge that, but you know, I, I don't like people, a lot of people have this impression that he drank a lot of bourbon and played a lot of poker. And that's not, you know, he, he did both of those things, but not to the point that it got in the way of him doing his day job, let's put it that way. Sure. 
Fair enough. Um, Will, uh, I understand uh, from one of our viewers that uh, he received a Torah as, as president. Will that be on view in the museum? Yes, it will. It was, it was on, on display before, but it will, it will be a much, uh, a much better display, uh, a much more prominent display, I should say, in this whole story of Israel. It's a very interesting story. The Torah uh, belonged to a young man whose father was uh, a very prominent rabbi uh, in, uh, in New York and uh, associated with one of the leading uh, seminaries. And, and uh, Chaim Wiseman was coming to town and he was going to visit President Truman and he needed a gift. And he, so they called this, this boy's father and said, this, this rabbi, and they said, we need something to give President Truman. What we need a gift, what can we take? And, uh, and th this, this young man had been given a Sefer Torah for his bar mitzvah when he was 13. He was now about 20, I think 19 or 20, but they had kept it at this museum place. Cause it's not the kind of thing you just keep in your living room. It's a very valuable, you know, it's all hand copied. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, work of art. And uh, so the, this rabbi said, well, I don't, I can't give you anything out of the museum collection, but I do have this, our family, we have this Sefer Torah that was used for my son's bar mitzvah. They said, that'll be great, that'll be fine. So they took that, they took this boy's uh, Torah and they gave it to President Truman as a gift. And Truman was thrilled to have it. He loves, loved it and kept it. Even when they said, boy, it'd be nice to have that displayed in a Jewish museum. And he said, it'll be very nice to have it displayed in my museum so people can come and, and see it. And uh, so, so we had an event with that Torah at the uh, National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia uh, just about a year ago, right before COVID, um, when we could still travel and do these kinds of things. And, um, and that, that young boy who became a rabbi himself um, was celebrating the 80th anniversary of his bar mitzvah. And we were able to, he was able to see that Torah for the first time in 80 years. It was a very uh, wonderful experience, and it's a, it's a it's a beautiful piece. And Truman's relationship to the Jewish community is is profound uh, to this day, and uh, I think there's a lot of respect, and and uh, he's very revered there and uh, uh, among among those uh, among those circles. And uh, so we're very proud to have that that Torah very prominently displayed in our Israel gallery. Great. A couple other questions about the. Uh... Uh, the museum will there still be an oval office there is the oval office is has been refreshed as far as paint and whatnot but the 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 oval office of truman's that we have the replica oval office i should say is based on photographs of the real oval office in 1950 so it is an exact replica of what we know that the oval office looked like when truman used it so we're not taking any liberties with that. We're putting it back exactly as it was. Everything on the desk is where he had it. Everything on the wall is what he had displayed. But um, it, it is a, it, it's one of the real highlights, I think, of the museum because everybody, you know, for, for most people, that's as close as they'll ever get to the West Wing of the White House. I mean, it's not, you know, the West Wing isn't a place, even if you take a White House tour, which is, you know, increasingly difficult, obviously. Uh, you know, very, very few people ever get to see the actual Oval Office. So that will, that will continue to be a big part of our offering. It's, it's a big brag for the presidential, most of the presidential libraries, as you know. Um, what about, uh, as you were going through the tour, anything on the assassination attempts? Um, I, it's mentioned in, in, in passing. I mean, it is a, uh, it is a pretty dramatic moment when these um, Puerto Rican nationals are trying to draw attention to their uh, cause and they, they take shots and Truman, they're living in Blair House at the time, Truman comes to the window to wonder what all the ruckus is about. And they, they say, get, get, you know, get away, get him away from the window. But uh, sadly, uh, one of his secret service detail was, was killed in that, in that attempt. And Truman had to go on that day. He was giving a speech, I believe out at Arlington. And uh, so, yeah, that is definitely something that was a, you know, shaped his experience. You know, it's interesting, after Truman left office, I mean, in those days, there was no pension, there was no secret service protection, there was nothing. And, and he just was Mr. Citizen, he just went home. And it wasn't until the Kennedy assassination that Johnson insisted that former presidents be given secret service protection. 
And the Trumans resisted it. Bess in particular, she did not want that level of interference in their life. You know, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, I mean, I know it's necessary these days, but I can't imagine that it's very comfortable to have people hanging around you all the time, you know, watching out for your safety or whatever. That, that sounds like a drag to me, but um, she didn't want that. But um, Johnson said, now, Bess, we can't have anything happen to you and Harry. So he, he loved him and he wanted that to happen that way. And, and so it did, they, they, they relented and they had that kind of protection afterwards. So no presidential protection is, uh, is, a, huge, is a huge deal. And certainly that assassination attempt uh, had to be uh, jarring for, for the Trumans. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned post-presidency. Uh, he had a famous road trip. Um, does the, mm -hmm. Is that part of the legacy, the post-presidency gallery that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, we have what we've done. Um, we, we have a lower level where we have rotating galleries and we've always had that rotating gallery in the lower level. But, you know, Truman was a car guy. He and Bess loved cars. And so those were always on um, display. But sometimes when we had a gallery closed to be able to refurbish it for the next exhibit, install the next exhibit, those cars wouldn't be available. So now what we've done is we've carved out an area in our lower level for um, kind of a collection collection highlights area, if you will. So the cars are on permanent display there. And the story of that, of those, um, those cars, and of course, the, the, the story you're alluding to is when Truman, I think he's invited to give a, a talk. And I'm blanking on the moment, whether it was in New York or Washington, but he, you know, there, he's a former president. So they say, well, hey, let's, best, let's jump in the car and let's take a road trip. Let's go back east. And so, so they get in the, their Chrysler and they take off just the two of them flying down the highway former president and first lady on their way to uh, to the east coast and of course everywhere they went you know uh, the, the the press would just emerge the paparazzi the you know the whatever and every gas station they stopped at every hotel they tried to book into you know the, oh, yeah, the president's here and everybody would you know of course there was no social media or anything but the phone bank would light up in that town and everybody would come running down to the general store or whatever and try and get an autograph or a photograph or something with the president and first lady. And I think it's, in some ways it's kind of naive, but it's kind of refreshing to think of that level of humility when he thought, well, it's just not that big of a deal. Nobody knows, nobody cares. Nobody's gonna come and bother us. I mean, we're just gonna drive at this court. You know, but he's this very famous figure by this point because, you know, Roosevelt certainly was, was the radio president, but Truman is the first president to really move around enough and, and travel enough to be sort of photographed in these different settings, but also to be on television regularly. Now it's not like in the way that Kennedy and other presidents would kind of perfect a television persona. Truman is actually pretty flat on television, but, but he was on television enough that he was recognizable and people saw him and knew him as the president. Okay. I know we've got a couple more minutes left. I wanna see if I can get a few more of these questions in. Sure. Did he really take a long walk every day? He took a long walk every day, even in retirement. Uh, I, I mentioned he didn't have secret service. So the, the independence, the city of independence loaned him a police officer, a retired police officer to, uh, to go with him. And I'll tell you just a quick story about his, his humility that I think is a very interesting point about this long walk. He would go on a walk every day. And there was a, there was a woman, a young mother, I believe she was from Germany, but she was an immigrant, hadn't been in the country very long. And so, she, she would go on this walk every day with this, with this older guy that lived in the neighborhood. She would just kind of meet up with him. It wasn't like they planned to go on a walk, but uh, one day her friend waved her in from the street and said, Lily, what are you doing? What? And she said, oh, I just go for a walk. She had her little baby buggy and had her child. She said, we just, it seems like almost every morning we kind of meet up with this lovely old gentleman. He just lives around the corner and we go for a walk. And she said, do you have any idea who that is? And she said, no, he's just some old guy who lives around the corner. It's like, that's the former president of the United States. This woman had no idea. And what I love about that story is that in all of those walks, Harry Truman never once said, well, when I was at Potsdam with Churchill, or well, when I was in the Oval Office, or when I was president, when I did this, when I did that, he never ever referenced anything about his past that this woman even knew that he had been the president of the United States. And I, I just find that, uh, an incredible episode just in and of itself that, that, that the man had the kind of humility to not need to say, to have some 
person know that he had achieved the height that he had achieved? Well, so it obviously says a lot about him. Uh, let's do, we'll do one more here. And before we wrap up, uh, is it true that he's the first person to get a Medicare card? Yes, that is true. That happened in 1965 on the auditorium stage at the Truman Library. Lyndon Johnson thought so highly of Harry Truman and Bess and appreciated the effort that they had gone to to try to get universal health care. That's the thing about Truman's legacy. You know, you, you can trace so many topics to our own time that we're still struggling with. But Johnson went out there and on that stage in our auditorium, he signed the Medicare Medicaid Act. And then he issued card number one to Harry Truman and card number two to Bess. Well, that's a terrific story. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to ask this one, one last one here that came in from one of our uh, guests that I have, a, I have a connection to because I used to work at the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian. Oh. Uh, Elaine de Kooning produced a painting for the Truman Library of JFK. And there's, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, famously, a must be a copy of it at the, at the National Portrait Gallery because I'm a fan. Uh, will that be on view uh, at the new renovated museum? Well, um, we have, as I mentioned, some rotating gallery space downstairs. I'm, um, I'm hopeful. What I would like to do is there's a little room where we can put some um, portraits. I'd like to put up portraits of all the presidents that Truman knew and have a little discussion of his relationship. You know, Ronald Reagan, he, Truman didn't know him as president, but uh, Reagan was a big Truman supporter back in the day. Uh, he knew Herbert Hoover, brought Her Herbert Hoover back into government service. Of course, he knew FDR, he knew Ike, um, he knew Kennedy, he knew Johnson. Uh, uh, these are uh, important uh, relationships, I think, that, 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 he, he, that he crossed paths with all these presidents. And yeah, the de Kooning, um, I'm a big fan of the National Portrait Gallery. I love those presidential Every time I'm in Washington, I try and, well, in pre-COVID days, we'll see how it is now, but I, I try to walk through there. I love those portraits. Um, there are some great portraits of, of Harry Truman. The, uh, uh, the official one by Greta Kempton is the one that, that, that was most often displayed, the one that we have, and there's a copy of it at the portrait gallery as well. But, um, but that de Koenig, no, we have the original uh, JFK de Koenig, and it's better than the one at the National Portrait Gallery. Don't tell them I said that, but just, just so you know, when you come to Independence, uh, I will show you that even if it's not on display, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull it out and see that you get to see it. It's, 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 it's a stunning piece. It really is. And I'm not, you know, I'm not an art guy. I can't really wax too poetic about that, but I, it's beautiful. It really is a fine, fine piece. I will say lined up with uh, some of the other uh, presidential portraits in the, at the portrait gallery, it has a little bit more zeal and, and pop than yeah. you know, some yeah. of the, uh, the ones from the 1800s. Well, this has been fantastic. We've got, you know, just to close out with you, the, um, lots of questions about obviously when you're going to reopen, uh, mm -hmm. it will be determined by COVID and the rollout mm -hmm. and all that, but will the museum be ready? So, you know, June, call it June 1, the M Truman Museum, the Truman site is available to the public. Mm -hmm. Is the museum ready or do you have oh, a yes. big kickoff weekend? Where, where, well, where we stay? will, we will definitely have a, um, I think what will happen is when we'll be ready to roll. I mean, the, the construction, as, as you saw in those photos, we're, we're wrapping up and need to clean up some of the site. But honestly, it's, um, it's, it's really uh, ready to go and have artifacts installed and things. The, as soon as COVID allows, we will be able to, even if it's in a limited fashion, begin to let the public in. I think what, what you'll see is a soft opening where we just sort of quietly kind of start to let the local public back in. And then as once we realize that we're in the free and clear and that COVID is you know, in, in, the, in the rear view mirror and that enough people are vaccinated and that kind of thing, then we want to have a, a formal kind of VIP ribbon cutting with uh, you know, appropriate level participation from, from folks. And, and, and that will be kind of our big moment of celebration to, to literally cut a ribbon and, and take uh, you know, hopefully former presidents or whatever, you know, whatever can, we can do. But again, with, it's hard to make those predictions in this COVID environment because I've, uh, I've been wrong enough times now that I'm sufficiently humbled as to just say, you know, it'll happen when it happens. So Fair I'm, enough. I'm, Fair I'm enough. done trying to, trying to stay a step ahead of COVID. It, it is what it is and we're all kind of dealing with it. So, and we, you know, the, the archives has done a marvelous job I think of taking it seriously and uh, keeping our staff safe and keeping the public safe. I mean, I, I tell local reporters who pressure me all the time about, well, when are you gonna open, when are you gonna open? And I say, you know, when we do open, I want the headline to be how phenomenal this new exhibit is. I don't want the headline to be that the Truman Library was the 
uh, a source of an outbreak of, of COVID in our community. I don't want to dampen the enthusiasm for this great work that we've that we've been able to do, and it's been fantastic. We've had national support. We've had tremendous support in Kansas City, uh, our institute board, and our our leadership there, and our federal staff. Everyone's just been terrific. I mean, it's it's one of those things that you just don't get to do very often in your in a career. Some people go their whole career and don't get to do what we've just done. So I'm very proud of that, very grateful to have been able to do it and really look forward to, to cutting that ribbon and getting you and lots of other people in there to, to celebrate with us. Well, we look forward to that with you. In the meantime, we want to encourage all of our viewers to go visit you online. I'm sure you have lots of resources and, and information to dig more into the, into the Truman legacy. And uh, obviously, once things are in the free and clear, we, we welcome them to come visit you in person and give their own review of this great new uh, experience that you've created. Kurt, thanks for the time today. I've got a Thank couple uh, closing uh, uh, housekeeping things, but we, we're delighted to feature the Truman Library and, and hear your voice uh, tell the story. And I'm, I'm eager to get get back out there, see all the, all the good work you've done. Well, we look forward to doing a program or something out there with you. And uh and uh, appreciate this opportunity to share our story uh, with your audience. It's been a, been a pleasure and been, been great to talk to you. Wonderful. All well, right. Thanks so much. Okay. And uh, to, our, uh, to our visitors and our viewers today, a few uh, last announcements. We appreciate all of our members who have joined us, um, our corporate supporters and donors. If you're not a member of the foundation, you can join at our website, archivesfoundation.org. And it is uh, Women's History Month. And so where else should you find a terrific uh, gift? Oh, I had a little problem there. Visit our online store at nationalarchivesstore.org for uh, your springtime uh, wares and items for Women's History Month. And of course, we've got some Truman things bio on on the screen and i hope you'll join us for our next uh, program coming up obviously the archives itself has lots of programs going on between uh now and then but on march 31st we'll be back with first ladies who risk their lives for civil rights the panel uh, will feature uh, dr diana carlin anina mcbride and nancy keegan smith um, it'll be a terrific way to close out uh, women's history month so i hope you'll register today for that. You can also follow us on social media, sign up for our emails. The National Archives is our nation's memory. What is past is prologue. On behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thank you for joining us today.